Um, and I'm very excited to be speaking with you all today about what I consider to be a very interesting topic, alternative music in the Arab world. Um, it's a very broad topic. It's a very specific topic at the same time. Um, so before we start, I'd just like to set the tone for this presentation. Um, it's not going to be super highly formal and academic. Uh, I haven't done years and years of research on this specific topic, but I personally find it to be very interesting. And I think talking about it is an interesting way to raise certain questions about the Arab world, about music, about alternative movements, about subversive movements, about revolution and rebellion. So that's that's a tone I want to set for today. And I really hope um, at the most basic level to introduce you to several musicians who classify themselves as alternative or are classified as alternative in the Arab world. So um, just a disclaimer, we will be listening to quite a bit of music um, in today's presentation. So prepare yourselves mentally for that. Um, and I hope that you'll actually find some interest in a couple of these groups and carry on listening to their work um, after this presentation ends. So just a brief overview of what I'll be talking about today. Um, I'll start off with kind of a theoretical discussion on what alternative music is, kind of a confusing topic, so hopefully I can shed some light on that. Um, then I'll move into a brief discussion about the history of Arab music in general. Uh, we can't really understand what alternative contemporary Arab music is if we don't understand traditional uh, forms of Arab music. And after that, we'll kind of dive into uh, several different case studies, several different examples from across the Arab world. Um, so that includes Tut Ard, a band from the occupied Golan Heights, Mashrur Alayla, a band which recently disbanded but was from Beirut, Lebanon, Ras, who is a Lebanese rapper, singer, and songwriter. Um, then I have a, a small section uh, on music in the Arab Spring, the role of music in revolution and rebellion in the Arab states. And then a quick discussion on Mahraganat, which is Egyptian popular street music. So that's the overview for today's presentation. Um, and uh, we'll go ahead and get started with a couple, a couple news clippings and poster that I thought were uh, particularly interesting. Um, if we take a look at this, this image right here, this is a flyer for the Wasla Arab Alternative Music Festival. So this festival was held in 2017 in Dubai. Um, and the reason I chose to include it on this slide is that it's, it's self-identifying as alternative. It's self-identifying as Arab. So the festival, what it's really saying, what it's really proposing is alternative music as a form of genre. Um, and we'll come back to this idea of alternative music as a genre throughout the presentation. Um, but I wanted to start off with this flyer and we'll return to it later on. Um, really, what does it mean to be alternative? What does it mean to be in an alternative genre um, are all questions that we'll be discussing. And a couple other uh, clippings here. This is from BBC. It says, Musiqa underground, or Musiqa al badila an mada, which is saying, is should we consider this type of music to be underground music or alternative music? And what is it about? You know, what it is, what is it an alternative to? Uh, another question of defining. Um, the Arab News had a, a piece uh, a couple of years ago that said the Middle East alternative music scene is prospering at last. And then this interview here with Haaretz, an Israeli newspaper, um, is talking about alternative Arab music as a new space. So all of this is to say that there has been some popular discourse in recent years about a new movement within music in the Arab world. And the name of that movement is alternative music. Um, so the specifics of what, what it might constitute are up for discussion and we'll be discussing them in this presentation. But just keep in mind that according to many people, this is a new leaf in a long tradition of Arab music history. So what is alternative music? I've been throwing this term around a lot and I'll continue to throw it around uh, for the rest of this presentation. But broadly speaking, I think what's useful when we're thinking about alternative music is its oppositional nature. Uh, so most people would agree that alternative music is oppositional to mainstream music or ideology or whatever. Um, but at its core, it's oppositional. Um, there are a couple popular perspectives that people take to understand what alternative music is oppositional to. So I've included just a handful here to maybe elucidate a little bit further the terminology. Um, some might argue that alternative music or true alternative music has to be subversive in its economic uh, nature. So that means that it has to be subversive in its production, in its distribution, and its consumption. So some groups attempt to be alternative in this fashion by producing music and releasing it into a creative common space without payment. People can download and listen to it. They might consider that to be alternative in the way that it's subverting uh, uh, normal capitalist music production. 
Another perspective might be that alternative music is oppositional to hegemonic ideologies or oppressive systems. And in that context, alternative music may serve as a medium for subversive or radical political commentary. Uh, and we'll see quite a few examples today of alternative music groups that really do self-identify as alternative because of what they're saying in a political context with their music. And a third popular opinion that circulates in cultural critic circles might be the postmodernist explanation of what alternative music is. Um, in this context, alternative music is alternative to modernist music. Um, and in a compositional context, we might see with an alternative music, ironic use of language. We might see eclectic blendings of different styles of music from different parts of the world, from different musical traditions. We might see random uh, musical expression and we might see um, a musical composition that challenges or, or attempts to challenge, excuse me, um, uh, certain norms about music production or music composition. So I've included here just a few questions that I want to ask uh, as we begin this presentation to keep in mind as we talk through several different examples. Uh, the overarching question is who benefits from the alternative music classification in the context of the Arab world? So really, who is using this term? Why are they using it? What are they trying to say? And what is the context that they're saying it in? Um, two sub questions to this overarching question is one, does alternative music as a category sanitize more revolutionary forms of music? Um, does the category of alternative music essentially uh, um, obscure more uh, radical, more subversive forms of music? You know, what are we losing essentially in the process of calling some music alternative? And another question is, is the alternative music classification useful to resistance movements or revolutionary movements? So as a form of resistance, how should we be thinking about alternative music? Is it useful? A brief, very brief uh, history of Arab music tradition. Um, when we think about Arab music, obviously anytime we're making claims about Arab music in general, we'll be engaging in all sorts of generalizations. Um, you know, what really is the Arab world? What is Arab, so on and so forth. But I think for the purposes of this presentation, we can track in this slide, the development of a mainstream uh, sort of Islamic gold standard for traditional music. So the Arab music tradition arguably began in pre-Islamic musical tradition with written Arabic poetry that was later set to melody, that was set to rhythm. And then with the expansion and uh, creation of Islam, we see through time, through Al-Andalus, through other parts of the Middle East and North Africa, the development of a cohesive Islamic musical tradition. Um, and some of you may be familiar with the works of Al-Farabi or Al-Kindi, who are Arab philosophers that are very well known for their theorizations on music. Um, their work, as well as other works by other Arabs, see in the 14th century, the development of the maqam. Uh, the maqam is, it's twofold. It's a melody type and it's a form of improvisation. And so the maqam really became throughout Arab history, the gold standard, as I mentioned, of Arab traditional music. And much Islamic music that you hear today will be very easily distinguishable as Arab, as Islamic, based on its structure, which is the maqam. So between the 14th century and about the 20th century, there was, of course, dynamic change, as there is in any cultural uh, form of expression, as there is in any society. But what I see as the next significant shift in the Arab music tradition uh, came around the development of nationalist music. And the, and the nationalist music scene in post-independence Arab states. So this is mid 20th century, mid to later 20th century. We see the rise of uh, you know, star characters like Umm Kulthum, like Fairuz, like Abdel Halim Hafiz in the Egyptian context as well. And what they did is they, some would argue, they modernized Arab music. So Umm Kulthum is very well known for using Arabized instruments, such as the electronic keyboard or Western violins or other Western instruments that are able to play Arabic melodies and Arabic scales. So she really brought a global influence to Arab culture. Now, those of you that have listened to Umm Kulthum in the past or do listen to Umm Kulthum will know that her songs are sometimes 30 minutes. So if you're going to listen to an Umm Kulthum song in, uh, in entirety or an album, it's probably going to be a whole day endeavor. Um, Feruz, on the other hand, who's a Lebanese singer, began to sing songs that were about two to three minutes. So she used the Arabized instruments as Umm Kulthum did. She sang in Shami in the Levantine Arabic dialect, so it was accessible to the masses. She actively supported the Palestinian cause, therefore introducing uh, explicit political language or implicit political languages in most cases into her songs. 
and she shortened the, the music form of, of Arab music, Arab mainstream music. And between Um Kulthum and Feruz and today, I've characterized this broadly as a new contemporary pop influence genre. So we have the Nancy Ajrams, we have the Omar Diabs, and we have more contemporary artists today that, that one might consider to be mainstream because they call upon this tradition and fit into the general broader trends. So with that, let's go ahead and jump into a few case studies, a few examples of really interesting groups from across the Arab world that either themselves classify as, that either identify themselves, I should say, as alternative or are identified as alternative in some sort of social context. Uh, so the first band is Tut Ard. Um, it's a very interesting band. Tut Ard means strawberries in Arabic in the dialect that uh, the band members speak. And the band was founded in 2010. So Arab Spring was 2010, 2011, end of 2010, 2011. So it's quite a significant time to be starting a band. The two brothers that formed the band are Hassan and Rami Nakhla, pictured in the bottom right. And they are from Majd al Shams, which is in the occupied Golan Heights. Um, so for those of you who don't know, the Golan Heights was initially part of the political entity of Syria, but during the Six Day War in 1967 was occupied by Israel and has continued to be uh, part, has continued to be under Israeli occupation. Um, Majd al Shams is historically a Druze majority uh, area, and uh, the Druze are an ethno-religious minority, for those of you who are unaware, and live under very specific conditions when it comes to Israeli occupation. Um, and one of the one of the albums that we'll discuss from this band deals specifically with, with the Druze identity and what it means to grow up under occupation. So that's the context. All this is to say this is the context that the band was formed under. Um, on a musical note, I guess I can say, the band self-describes themselves as uh, performing Levantine blues, Tuareg guitar, and mountain reggae. So each of these categories is, it's quite eclectic. Um, and as you'll hear, and if you came in a little earlier, you heard a little bit of music that was playing from this band, is that it's quite unexpected if you had spent your entire life listening to Um Kulthum, to Feirouz, to even Nancy Ajram or Omar Diab. So the first album that Tut Art released was in 2011. The album is called Nuri Andaburi. And most of the songs in this specific album deal with nature. Um, it appears that the artists of the band really want to force some sort of reckoning with their day-to-day -day existence and what they feel is a lack of connection to nature. So one of the songs I've selected is called Ruh Bladi, which means the spirit of my homeland or the spirit of my country. And the lyrics read, Jabal Sahara wa Bahru Gaba, a mountain, desert, sea, and forest. Tabi'at Ruha Bladi, nature is the spirit of my homeland. Um, this theme is shared throughout quite a few different songs in this album specifically, but they also have other songs in this album that are perhaps more political in, um, in substance, such as Gina, which I've included here. The lyrics read, We came from the village that they occupied, speaking about um, the Israeli state. We grew up and forgot what they did to us. We forgot that we have no unoccupied land. So this is a commentary on what it meant for them, for the artists to grow up in the Golan Heights, to grow up under occupation. And in multiple interviews, they've spoken about how they don't intend for their music to be political, um, which, is, which is somewhat interesting considering the language of occupation here. They say that they simply want to share their experiences, share the world through their eyes, how they live the world and they want to express it as part of music. So we might understand Tut Ard's music then in this context to be less of a medium for political commentary and perhaps more of a medium for um, resistance, right? As in com resistance through commentary on, on daily conditions rather than calling for some specific political project. So we'll go ahead and listen to just about 20 to 30 seconds of Ruha Bladi, the spirit of my homeland, and listen for the mountain reggae. This song really exemplifies mountain reggae. <laughs> So you get a feel for the music. It's quite, it's quite unexpected, right? It's quite unexpected. It's quite different. Um, 
and they have become very popular, very popular because people really are identifying with the the vibe of the music, so to speak. It's very popular amongst uh, younger generations. So the second album of Tout Arts that I'd like to discuss is Laissez Passer. Laissez Passer is a very interesting, this is the album that I mentioned earlier that deals specifically with uh, the Druze context. So for a little bit of historical context, a laissez passer is a citizenship card. Um, in French, it means let pass. So a laissez passer is a card that was given by the Israeli state to Druze occupants or Druze inhabitants of the Golan Heights after the occupation. On the card, for people who are Druze and people that are living in the Golan Heights, the card reads citizenship undefined. So occupants of this region, inhabitants of this region are actually able to request Israeli citizenship, but in doing so, they're forced to give up their Syrian citizenship. So there's quite a few different, different uh, dimensions to this discussion, to this problem. Some inhabitants of the Golan Heights don't want to give up their Syrian citizenship because they believe that the Golan Heights actually belongs to Syria. Some don't want to give up their Syrian citizenship because they fear what the Syrian regime might do if the Syrian state is ever to take back the Golan Heights by force. However, some do not want to give up their Syrian citizenship because they feel doing so would be in some way um, condoning the occupation of the Israeli state. So this song, Laissez Passer, the song is, and the album have the same name, says, Al-Hawi, Animish Mawjood, I do not exist on an identity card. Without citizenship, I don't have any borders. And if you ask me, I'll tell you I play the oud, which is a traditional music instrument. And bil musiqa, any asfur tayyar. But, however, with music, I'm a flying bird. With music, I can transcend these borders. With music, I have no need for my citizenship card. And I've included a quote here at, down at the bottom from Hassan, uh, one of the two brothers. And he says, no, we are not Druze. Our parents are Druze. I don't represent the Druze, and they don't represent me. So he and his brother, in a sense, are rejecting the identity that has been grafted upon them. Perhaps they, they have issues with, with the community, with the religion, but they really are um, in, in the most revolutionary sense, I guess you could say, shaking off the identities that have been given to them. So we'll go ahead and listen to just a little bit from, uh, from this song, which is more upbeat than the previous song and is a little more rock inspired. <laughs> I really like the music video for this uh, song as well. I think it demonstrates more clearly the intent behind their message as they're driving, they're showing signs, right? Signs in Hebrew, signs in English, um, what it means for them to live day to day under occupation. And the last album of Tut Arts that I'd like to discuss is their most recent release, which is called Migrant Birds. Uh, they released it in 2020, so it's more recent. And this was released during the, the COVID pandemic, I believe. Um, this album, interestingly, has much more explicit political language, um, which is why I feel it's important to include it. In the previous two, there was commentary on day-to-day -day life under occupation. Um, however, in this song in particular, Trouble Watan, which means trouble, homeland, trouble, country, um, the, the artists become a little more explicit in what they're asking for. They say, there's a trap in the soil of my homeland. There's corruption. There's the smell of rottenness. They say, let's have a cultural revolution. Dam the patriarchy. A revolution of love and gender freedom. And also that generations that cannot change often get stuck. So alternative here, certainly more as a political medium uh, to, to call for societal change, to call for revolution. And it's a bit of a departure from their earlier songs, which I find to be quite interesting. So we'll listen to just a little bit from Trouble Lathan. And interesting in this song is it's quite more, it's a little more techno uh, inspired. It's a little more techno inspired, kind of a little bit of an 80s feel. <laughs>
And I think the name of the album, Migrant Birds as well, is is quite significant because they've talked previously about wanting to transcend borders and music being a way for them to be flying birds. And I think that's that's the reason that they decided to name this latest album Migrant Birds. So that is Tut Ard. That is Tut Ard, the, the band from the Golan Heights, uh, contemporary and perhaps alternative, both in form as in departing from previous understandings of the Islamic or Arab music tradition, and uh, also perhaps alternative in, in demanding a uh, political, a different political reality. So our next band, our next group is Mashur Alayla. And before we move on, I'd just like to ask you all to, to take note of this image in the top left of a person holding a pride flag up at an event. This will become relevant later on. So Mashru Alayla in Arabic means overnight project. Um, it can also have the dual meaning of Layla's project. And so the band members that created this band have They've been asked many a times in different interviews, you know, what's the real reason behind the name? And some of them have described it as, as being either Layla's project or being overnight project. But for a little context um, about this group, you know, when did they start? What are they writing about? They were founded in 2008 in Beirut, Lebanon. Um, the members of the band were all students at the American University of Beirut. They were studying graphic design. They were studying architecture. And the story goes that they were feeling somewhat depressed uh, they were feeling somewhat disaffected with the state of the world, 2008 Lebanon. They were feeling as though their lives didn't have much direction, much meaning. And so they decided to put together an open workshop, an open music workshop. So they would hold jam sessions day in, day out. They would play late into the night, which is perhaps where the title comes from, Overnight Project. And the band it was a member of four or five different uh, people who had joined together as part of this workshop process. So they've released four international albums. Um, they have four main members. I've listed their names here down at the bottom, but there's a couple other members that come and go with time. What's important to note about Mashru Alayla is that the lead singer, Hamid Sinno, is openly gay. Um, so he is perhaps the most famous, the most well-known Arab openly gay musician of our contemporary era. So it's quite, quite important to keep that in mind when we're talking about their work and about the context uh, under which they're producing music. So Mashru Alayla is also perhaps one of the more controversial groups uh, that produce alternative music in today's Arab world. And there's there's been quite a number of controversies over the years. So I'm gonna run through about three different controversies uh, in chronological order. In 2017, if we take a look down at this New York Times article, Mashru Alayla was performing in Cairo. They had a large concert, their concerts are incredibly popular always sold out. They've done tours internationally. They've done tours in Western Europe in the United States. Um, but this concert as well was sold out. One of the attendees, Sada Hagazi, was a 27-year-old communist, um, leftist. She was openly gay as well, and she was a, a known activist in the LGBT community in Cairo. She brought a pride flag with her, and she's the one that I pointed out in the picture earlier that, that is pictured as well in this New York Times article and this tweet here as holding the pride flag at the event. After the concert, however, she was arrested and imprisoned by the Egyptian security forces. And it later became apparent that she had been tortured um, by the Egyptian security forces and had been diagnosed with PTSD um, as a result of these, these horrific uh, experiences. So Sada sought asylum and she gained asylum in Canada. And tragically in 2020, uh, news came to light that she had died by suicide. And this middle, uh, opinion piece is a letter to the editor by one of the band members, one of the Mashru Alayla band members. It's titled, She Waved a Rainbow Flag at Our Cairo Show, Tragedy Followed. Um, so this is one instance of how Mashru Alayla, because of simply the identity of one of the band members, has become uh, you know, a highly polarizing force in the Arab world um, and has led to quite a few people being arrested, being tortured, and in, unfortunately, in the, in the case of Sarah Hagazi, you know, ending their life. On that night in Cairo, I believe another six or seven people were also arrested uh, simply for attending. Uh, the next controversy that I'd like to discuss is in 2019 in regards to this uh, Guardian article up here. Uh, Mashru Alayla was invited to, to perform at the Byblos International Music Festival in Lebanon. It's a, quite a well-known festival, international attendance, etc. cetera. Um, but the Catholic Church specifically, as well as other local Lebanese Christian groups, pressured the concert organizers to cancel the Mishra Alayla concert. 
um, over, and this is important to know, over claims that the group was inciting sectarian violence, uh, which of course in Lebanon is quite a serious claim that has a long history behind it. The reason was that in 2015, Mashur Aleda had released an album, and we'll listen to a song from it, this album here in blue, Ibn al -Layl. They had released the album in 2015, and some of the songs, two of the songs in particular, from the album were uh, accused of being blasphemous um, of the Christian establishments in Lebanon. And for that reason, the concert was canceled. Um, There's a huge backlash from the International Human Rights Committee, uh, of the human rights community, I guess I should say. Um, and this blew up internationally and became you know, quite, quite a significant moment for alternative music in the Arab world. The fallout from that, however, takes us into the third controversy, um, which was last September, September 2022, actually just a few months ago, the band announced that they would be disbanding. Uh, the reason behind it is because of hate messages and because of harassment online. So Hamid Sinno, the lead singer who is gay, who's openly gay, had received what he said were hundreds of thousands of messages of hate simply because he was openly gay. He described singing with the band, performing with the band as a constant battle for breath. Um, it was quite difficult for him and the band to go anywhere, to perform anywhere without endangering the lives of people like Sada Hagazi, uh, like people who just wanted to attend and listen to their music. And because of this harassment and because of how much pushback they were receiving from different governments, different groups, different religious establishments in the Arab world, they decided it would be best if they disbanded. So this is the context that Mashur Alayla is, is, uh, is producing music in. In terms of alternativeness, um, their music, some of their music is explicitly political in the sense that it can be understood as a medium for demanding political change. But more often than not, a lot of their music has sort of a queer iconography or is relating to queer issues implicitly. Uh, one of the songs is Shim El Yasmin. This was one of the songs that generated some controversy around the band. Shim El Yasmin means smell the jasmine. So Hamid Sinno in this song, is speaking to a man. As a man, he's speaking to a man. Those of you who know Arabic, you'll know if you listen to the song, all of the verbs and all of the possessives are, are conjugated to um, being addressing a man, which is quite significant. He says, brother, don't forget me, my love, my prize. And again, he's speaking to a man. I would have liked to keep you near me, introduce you to my parents, have you crown my heart, cook your food, sweep your home, spoil your kids, be your housewife. But you're in your house and I'm in another. God, I wish I'd never let you go. And he did confirm in an interview later on that he was singing about a former sweetheart. So we'll listen to just a little bit from this song. This was performed live, uh, not with his band, but with a quartet. And it's quite lyrical and quite emotional. Yasmin. And the second song I want to focus on from Mashur Alayla is also from the album Son of the Night or Ibn al -Layl. This song was more explicitly referenced by Christian groups when they were getting the uh, concert canceled in Biblos in 2019. The lyrics read, liver baptized in jinn, I dance to ward off the jinn, drown my liver in jinn in the name of the Father and the Son. So the words being used here in the name of the Father and the Son are certainly of religious origin. Um, but Hamid Sinno, the member, did later uh, clarify that the song is really not about um, blaspheming any religion. It was not intended to blaspheme any religion. But instead, in his own words, he said it's about going to a club and getting wasted is essentially what, what the real um, motivation behind writing the song is. So we'll listen to it just a little bit from this song. Um, it's a little more difficult to find recordings of this song because of how much controversy it's garnered. It's been uh, more heavily controlled. I'm 
so on. So that is Jin by Mashur Leila. And I'll, I'll just just before we move on to the next artist, I'll, I'll say that Mashur Leila is is interesting to consider in, in the context of alternative music because they're incredibly well known. They're internationally famous. And some might argue that they have become part and parcel with the capitalist mode of production. So if our critique was, was uh, being leveled towards alternative music groups that are not necessarily alternative economically, you know, we need to raise the question of, is Mashur Alayla actually all that alternative if they're performing to sold out audiences across the world? So the next artist, I'll go, brief, I'll go quickly over Arras. Um, Arras was born in Tripoli in Lebanon. He was previously a banker and he worked in finance and he's also been trained as a journalist. Um, he's a rapper. So as opposed to Tut Ard and Mashur Leila, who are more lyrical in their work, Mazin Sayyid, or as he's known, Arras, which means the head, um, is much more uh, rap based. And he's quite explicit in his, in his political language. Um, politically, as he's expressed himself in, in interviews on YouTube with different magazines, with different publications, he's quite leftist in his uh, political ideology. And much of that thought is reflected in his music. So one of his songs says, my body is an economy and I'm in agony of a dangerous change. Do you sell the country? You know, what do we do? Should we sell Lebanon? Should we sell our country to survive? Another one of his songs, which is Qariq, in one line, he says, who are you worshiping? Are you worshiping a prophet of the book or the prophet of Aramco and OPEC? So as opposed to maybe the more uh, a subtle political nature of Mashur Alayla and Tut Ard's lyrics, Mazen Sayyid Ras is really quite direct in his calling out of, of certain actors and trends within politics in the Arab world. So we'll move now into a quick discussion on the role of music and the Arab Spring. And the reason why I want to include this that I mentioned at the beginning is to, to ask the question, should we be considering revolutionary music from the Arab Spring as alternative? Um, are we losing something by referring to it as alternative? Are we discounting the radical nature of this music by referring to it as alternative? Um, what, what really does alternative mean in the context of explicitly revolutionary language. So the first artist uh, in the context of the Arab Spring that I want to discuss is El General. And some of you may be familiar with El General. He's quite uh, significant in Arab Spring history. He was born in 1989 in Tunisia. And he began making music in 2007, which was subject to very strict censorship by the Ben Ali regime in Tunisia at the time. Uh, his most famous song is Rais and Bled, and we'll listen to just a little bit of that in, in a minute, which he released in December of 2010. Uh, December of 2010, if you'll recall, was also the same month that Mohamed Bouazizi, the vegetable hawker, the Tunisian vegetable hawker, set himself on fire and effectively began the Arab Spring uh, in Tunisia. So he released this song, Rais and Bled, president of the country in December 2010. Mohamed Bouazizi, uh, self-immolated on December 17th, 2010. And then El General released another song called Tunisia, Our Country on December 22nd, 2010. After releasing that song, he was detained by the Tunisian security forces. And the story goes that he was in prison and didn't know how popular his songs were getting. And when he was finally released, he came out into the streets and heard the people chanting for revolution using his song, this song in particular. So that's Rais al Bled by El General. And in a similar vein, uh, the next artist I want to talk about, who's quite similar to El General, is uh, Rami Assam. So Rami Assam was born in 1987. He is most well known for his live performance at Tahrir Square in 2011 in Cairo. And this is actually an incredible video that's recording his initial performance in 2011 uh, that we'll take a look at in just a second. The song he's singing in this video is called Irhal, which means in Arabic, it's an imperative. It means leave leave. Um, so he's saying it had to the regime of Hosni Mubarak. And Rami Assam is a self-described rock artist, um, which is quite interesting because 
this brings into question alternative music as perhaps composition, right? Is he alternative in, in style of music because he's not singing classical Egyptian music or is he alternative because of his political message? Um, it's a question. And this song was actually brought together by Rami Assam listening to the chants in the streets. So you'll hear, Yaskut, Yaskut, Hosni Mubarak, you know, fall, fall, Hosni Mubarak. You'll hear, Irhal, you'll hear, Ashab, Yurid, Isqat, An Nidam, which means the people want the regime to fall. So all of those chants he brought together in this song. Um, and there is quite a, a graphic depiction of a doll of Hosni Mubarak being hanged in this video, just uh, a fair warning. and so on. So that's Rami Assam. And again, the question is, is this music revolutionary and alternative? Is it simply revolutionary? And are we losing any meaning behind the music of Rami Assam and, and El General if we call their music alternative? And we'll return to that question a little later as well. So now our last uh, example, or our last discussion of a, of a group or a type of music in the Arab world is Mahraganat. So Mahraganat is uh, popular Egyptian Cairo originating street music. Uh, it began in the early 2000s, and the story goes that this form of music was born in the working class neighborhoods of Cairo, when a group of, of young men most likely pirated some music software on laptops, and they began recording their own vocals, they began sampling traditional Egyptian music, and they began using uh, free sounds that they could find online. So if any of you have ever used GarageBand or some similar audio mixing software, you'll know that there's a set list of, of sound effects that you can use. And that is what formed the base for Mahraganat. And Mahraganat is uh, a Persian word, actually, that means festivals, Mahragan, that became Mahraganat. So it means festivals, and it really is celebratory. Um, it makes you want to dance. It's very high energy. In many cases, it's quite vulgar in its language. It's quite gritty, um, and it's quite chaotic. You'll really find a lot of Mahraganat being played in clubs um, and parties in the Egyptian streets. And interestingly, in 2020, the Egyptians' musician syndicate banned Mahraganat. They did not allow any Mahragan artists to receive membership to the organization. And in Egypt, this is effectively censorship because musicians who do not have this license cannot perform in public areas. They cannot perform at events. They cannot create, produce, or distribute or sell records. So it became quite difficult for them to, to continue producing and performing. Um, there was one Egyptian congressional official who described Mahraganat as a virus that is more dangerous than coronavirus for Egyptian society and for all Arab societies. So there really has been, in many ways, a moral panic in Egyptian society about the influence of Mahraganat uh, on the political ideologies of the youth, um, on the, the, the general social unrest in Cairo and in Egypt. And the government has been cracking down even recently on Mahraganat. In October of last year of 2022, they banned 19 more artists um, in, in an effort to crack down on their music and an effort to, to, to prevent their music from being heard. Uh, and the question is, is Mahraganat also alternative music? We could argue that Mashur Alayla and Tut Art are alternative, as we, as we have done, but Mahraganat in some ways is even more subversive than their music. They, they are able to perform at international levels. They're able to produce albums and sell and distribute them. But Mahraganat really as, as, a, as a form of music is perhaps more subversive and revolutionary than anything Mishra Alayla and Tut Ard and even Arras uh, have ever done. And in some ways, I think about Mahraganat music as closer in, uh, in subversive nature to maybe revolutionary music of the Arab Spring even though Mahraganat does not deal explicitly with political concepts. So we'll listen to just a little bit of this song. This is called Bint El Giran, or The Neighbor's Daughter. That's by Hassan Shakush and Umar Kamal. Uh, quite a popular song, has generated a lot of controversy in Egyptian society. 
feel for it it is it's dance music uh so to wrap up that that concludes the example section of the of the presentation the case study um and so we'll return to the arab alternative music festival that i was discussing at the beginning of the presentation just recently uh the wasla music festival announced that it would be coming to riyadh in saudi arabia for the first time in march um and this is in 2022 so this down here is a screenshot from the wasla music website that's essentially saying that this music festival is welcomed by the king of Saudi Arabia, the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And I suspect that this is this is in large part inspired by MBS's 2030 vision for Saudi Arabia as becoming more open, more welcoming, more inclusive, so on and so forth, all towards uh, uh, um, fulfilling the ultimate goals for the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, whatever, whatever we might think those are. And a quote from the website is, by shedding light on the arts of our Arab homeland, we aim to create awareness by encouraging positive change in artistic expression. So it seems to me in this, in this case that alternative music as a term to describe truly revolutionary or subversive music has been co-opted, right, by governmental entities, by state entities, perhaps by capitalist entities as well. Um, and that we might do better to choose different language to describe music that is more explicit in calling for revolution and radical change, uh, such as the music that we witnessed during the Arab Spring. Some closing thoughts. Again, these are not, these are not very academically fleshed out. These are thoughts that I had while listening to this music and thinking about the term alternative music, is that perhaps self-identification by different groups as being alternative is a method to unify or amplify similar strains of subversive political messages, right? Perhaps simply by giving a name to a genre or a type of music, we're allowing people subaltern voices in a way to, to identify with each other, to come together, to have festivals, to celebrate and to elevate their message. This is one interpretation that I've been thinking about. Another alternative, alternative interpretation of alternative music is that the category itself of alternative music might in some, in many ways, be sanitizing or obscuring more subversive elements, right? So if we're saying the music of El General and the music of uh, Rami Assam during the Arab Spring is alternative, as well as Mashr Alayla, as well as Arrat, and as well as Mahraganat, I think in many ways we're actually flattening the messages that uh, that these groups are attempting to put forward. Um, and I think in many ways we're we're distracting from the the actual conditions that each of these specific groups are living under um, and what they're really trying to say about their day-to-day -day lives. So with that, I will conclude. Uh, thank you so much for your time. And I think we're moving into a question and answer uh, segment now. So thank you. Thank you, Vishal, and thank you everyone. Um, for being here with us. This was an amazing presentation, Vishal. Um, and while we're waiting for questions in the chat, um, I wanted to ask you about um, the Abras using um, modern standard Arabic in some of his songs versus other um, musicians or singers that you've talked about that only use colloquial Arabic. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Oh, it's a great question. Um, I think in many ways, when Feruz began singing in the in the uh, spoken register of Arabic in the Shami and the Levantine dialect, she was speaking directly to the people. So she had a message she wanted to say, and she was speaking to the people. And I think in the context of Arras or other contemporary musicians that choose to speak in modern standard Arabic, they have a general understanding that the public that they're speaking to will understand what they're saying, but instead that they want to communicate their messages in a more formal way. And I think in some cases in, in the context of Arras's music, the modern standard Arabic and the use of modern standard Arabic could be in some ways uh, 
an ironic twist on what he's really trying to say um, because the classical words, maybe the academic words that are being used, he might be assigning them a more subversive meaning when he talks about economy, when he talks about collapse, when he talks about selling a country. I really do think in many ways he's subverting those meanings because he's using them in a popular context, in a rap context. So just as if anyone in the United States who's a rapper were to start using academic words and concepts, they'll take on their own meaning. And I think that's what Ross might be attempting to do with his music. And I think I'll, I have some questions in the chat that I'll take a peek at. So let's see here. I see a question from the wonderful Saad Al Harishi. Uh, my question is beside its role from within the Arab world, what role do you see alternative Arabic music playing for Arabs living in the West? Oh, that's a, that's a great question, Saad. And I don't think I'm at all qualified to answer, but some, some thoughts I might be having on this uh, topic are that for Arabs living in the West, I think alternative music has a way of reaching young audiences here outside of the Arab world in a way that traditional or mainstream Arabic music may not, right? I mean, I think about my generation, I think about people I know, I think about music I listen to, and much of it is alternative in nature, right? It's a bit subversive, it's a bit politically subversive. And maybe I think as Arabs or people of Arab origin or in the Arab diaspora in the West are able to discover this music, they might be able to engage more directly with artists that may have similar political uh, orientations with them over in the Middle East or over in the Arab world. So perhaps perhaps it's a tool for connecting, perhaps it's a tool for, for reminding people in the West that, that there are young people who are annoyed at how things are um, in the Middle East as well in North Africa, and that's not simply just a Western phenomenon. And I see another question from Tausif. Uh, what made you interested in this topic? Uh, were you studying or delving into another topic and found yourself in this paradigm of alternative subversive music subcultures among Arabs? Uh, thank you for your question, Tausif. That's a, that's a great question. Um, I am very personally interested in what generates revolution and what generates rebellion, I guess you could say. And music, of course, is a large part of that. So. I didn't start off being interested in alternative music in the Arab world. I didn't, if I'm being completely honest, I didn't even know it really existed to the extent that it does. Um, but I started doing readings about historical revolutions in, in uh, the Arab world, right? Thinking about in Syria, thinking about the Arab Spring, going back, going back even to the, uh, the post-independence revolutions. And you start noticing some trends. You start noticing that there's music, there's popular music that's behind each and every single one of these movements. So I, I figured it would be worth my time to look into what these people are saying and why they're saying it. Um, so yeah, I appreciate your question. But I think there's revolutionary music all over the world, right? There's revolutionary music, there's subversive music all over the world. And uh, I was just lucky enough to have the opportunity to, to create this presentation in the Arab world context. But I'm certainly interested in exploring other forms of revolutionary music as well. And uh, thank you for that question, Tausif. And I see a presentation from Ustad Badr. Uh, many thanks. Thank you. I'm curious to know if you've tried to translate any of Aghani al-Mahraganat al-Misriya or mainly focused on its music. Um, so the question is if I've ever tried to translate the Mahraganat music. And I will say that I've tried. I've certainly tried. And I don't think I've been successful because <laughs> it's very hyper-local in its context. So I think if I was to really attempt to get a deep understanding of what's being communicated in Mahraganat music, I would need to be living in Cairo. I would be need, I would need to be of the the community that generated this music of the working class people of Cairo, and I'm not. So I feel like it's not my place to really attempt to translate and understand that music. Um, but I've tried, I will say, and uh, I don't think my Arabic skills or my or my uh, local knowledge of Cairo is 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 where it needs to be to really get what they're saying. And a question from Professor Miriam Cook: Have you followed El General and Rami over the past? decade. Yes, I have. Uh, I was going to mention this during the presentation and it slipped my mind. So thank you for asking that question. Um, uh, Rami, more specifically, I haven't kept up much with El General, but Rami Assam was actually in 2013 and 2014 exiled uh, from Egypt. So as part of the same general trend of cracking down on subversive or alternative forms of music, he was uh, he was exiled. He's not allowed back in the country, I don't believe. And he's certainly not allowed 
to play his music in Egypt. So I believe he's living in Sweden or Norway, some Scandinavian country, and he continues to produce his music there, but um, away from Egypt. Yeah. Thank you for the question. And a question from Julie, can you talk about translation and language? I know you did this presentation originally in Arabic, but did you find translation to English may have lost uh, some of the original power? Uh, yeah, thank you for the question, Julie. Um, I am a student of Arabic, for those of you who may not know, and uh, started learning the language maybe four, about four years ago. Um, and it's been incredibly interesting to see how over time I've realized that translation is so is more often inaccurate than it is accurate and so when i'm listening to the songs you really get a feeling from the lyrics when i can understand the words um a lot of times i can't understand the words especially if they're in levantine dialect or egyptian dialect but once i kind of trace back their genealogy through the modern standard arabic arabic meaning i can get a better feeling for what they're saying when you translate it into english the feeling is not there at all um the rhyme is not there the rhythm is not there it just feels wrong and so when i'm reading out the translations i'm like in my mind i'm trying to put them to the melody of the song but you can't really and it feels off and it feels awkward um so certainly it lost some of its original power but at the end of the day all translation is imperfect and you're going to have to make a compromise somewhere right so if you really want to share the message you're going to have to you're going to have to do your best. Um, and I did actually, in preparation for this presentation, look at quite a few different translated versions of the lyrics online. But I think about, I'd say for half of the songs that I presented in this presentation, there were somewhat decent English translations, and the other half, there were just uh, none. So for the early uh, songs from Tut Ard, the ones with the red logo and the guitar string, there's absolutely zero English translations for those lyrics because they really weren't popular. So I had to sit down and work through the translation with the help of, of uh, Professor Hassami to really understand what they were saying. The later songs, as they become more popular, are more easy to find in English translation. Same with Mishra Leila, because they're popular, they're verified on Spotify, they have hundreds of thousands of listeners, it's really much easier to comprehend what they're saying. And the level of translation that they've been able to afford because of their size and because of their presence means that I think for non-Arabic speaking audiences, their music may feel a little closer to its intended uh, uh, energy, so to speak. But thank you for the question. And a question from Sajal, we see, from your perspective, do you think the definition of alternative music in the Arab world is similar to the category for American music? How do you think cultural differences have affected its interpretation? And that makes plenty of sense. That's an excellent question. Um, I will say, I, I really don't know all that much about alternative American music. When I was doing research, I found a lot of work on alternative rock, right, that developed from underground music in the 70s and 80s. Um, and I think in the context of the Arab world, the term al-musiqa al-badila, or Air, uh, alternative music, has quite, quite a different meaning than alternative music in English. I think in English, um, and in the American context, alternative music may be a little closer to what we consider to be the indie genre of music than alternative music in the Arab world. I think alternative music in the context of the Arab world is more explicitly political in its assumption. And I think in the American context, it can kind of be indie, it can kind of be new, it can be unexpected or eclectic, as I was mentioning. And the second part of the question, how do you think cultural differences have affected its interpretation? Um, I wouldn't say it's all, I wouldn't really um, say that it's a cultural uh, difference that's affecting how it's, how it's developed, but rather just the distinct kind of economic and material conditions of Arabic speaking parts of the world and, and English speaking parts of the world in the United States that have formulated this different approach to understanding alternative music. I was surprised personally to find groups in the Arab world saying, you know, we're alternative because we're subverting forms of capitalist music production, like that explicitly. And I have not really seen much of that, at least in, in the American context with bands that are claiming to be alternative. They're more alternative in music style rather alter than being alternative in form. Uh, but yeah, thank you so much for your question. And uh, Ed says, how much do you know about the economy of these kinds of music? Yeah, excellent question. That's really an excellent question. Mashru Alela, when it first started, was one of those bands that said, we are going to be subversive. We're going to record our music. We're just going to release it in Creative Commons. Whoever's going to listen to it can listen to it. And that's the way it's going to be. Over time, though, as they became more famous, they stopped doing that. They started recording in studios. They started 
selling their music and they started having international tours, et cetera. So they moved away from that. Um, they do make money based on Spotify streams. Uh, much of the music that these alternative groups produce is with independent or smaller studios. And so a lot of the music that they will, a lot of the money that they will make, excuse me, actually comes from direct sales. So people will be buying their music. Uh, but more in depth on the economy, I'm not fully certain, but it's really something I would I would like to look into, right? How much how much of an alternative economy exists uh, for alternative music? It's, it's a very interesting question. 